Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. I recently read the book, The Dictatorship of Woke Capital by Steve Sukup, and it's really a great takedown of ESG, environment, social, and governance issues. And I saw a blog post by him the other day. So I sent him an email and asked if I could read it on camera because I think that everyone should be aware of how markets are shifting. It looks like investors have finally figured out that you can't have big tech without big oil. In fact, you can't really have much of modern society without big oil. And um, I'm just going to read it to you. And it's a bit of a long read on camera, but um, I think it'll give you some insights into some interesting movements in markets. So the blog is called The Political Forum. And he starts it with, we're winning. We'll be kind of brief today, kind of. And then he just makes a few comments about some nominal surgery that he's going to have. So his commentary will be shorter than usual. Um, but he says, we're winning. And by we, I mean everyone in general and those of us concerned about free and fair capital markets in particular. Two stories from the past couple of days serve as clear evidence of this. As you likely already know, Apple is no longer the world's largest company by market cap, capitalization. Once again, that title belongs to an oil company. Oil giant Saudi Aramco on Wednesday surpassed Apple as the world's most valuable firm. Aramco's market valuation was just under 2.43 trillion on Wednesday, according to FactSet, which converted its market cap to dollars. Apple, which fell more than 5% during trading in the U.S. on Wednesday, is now worth 2.3 trillion. The move is mostly symbolic, but it shows how markets are shifting as the global economy grapples with rising interest rates, inflation, and supply chain problems. Not only is the move mostly symbolic, but it's also likely temporary and almost certainly cyclical. Oil prices and oil companies are hot right now. Aramco's move is hardly a surprise. At the same time, however, Apple's move in the other direction is interesting and somewhat telling. We know that tech stocks generally are falling. The question is, why are they falling? That's a question with a complicated answer, obviously, but part of that answer, a part almost no one will talk about, is that tech companies are not all that resilient, which is to say, they're not all that sustainable. This isn't the tech wreck of 2000 when tech stocks tumbled because many were radically overvalued, many made no profits, and the technology involved was new and somewhat unpredictable. Today, tech stocks are, in many cases, the big established names of American business. And they're collapsing, at least in part, because their managers and executives have spent the last several years focusing on irrelevancies. <laughs> Instead of focusing on making the companies resilient and recession-proof, executives focused on making them morally acceptable and socially conscious. There's a reason, after all, that tech portfolios and ESG, environment social governance portfolios, are so similar. Tech companies have, in part, focused on superfluous social marketing agendas instead of building solid structures that protect shareholder equity. And now we're seeing the results of that, the effects of that. In other words, this isn't just a cyclical energy up, tech down story. It's also a story about the damaging effects of ESG on those companies that have wasted their time trying to satisfy activists who can never be satisfied. ESG is, in many ways, the opposite of sustainable. As you may also know, the other day Larry Fink of BlackRock conceded defeat, though he's pretending that he didn't. BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager, said it would likely vote to support fewer 
climate proposals from companies in its investment portfolio in 2022 than it did in 2021, because those climate proposals coming up for a vote this year are more exacting and demanding than in previous years. Just a side note, this is exactly what Larry Fink had pushed for in one of his big letters to corporate executives. More ESG, more climate risk disclosure. Now he's backing off. On Tuesday, BlackRock's investment stewardship team published a preview of how it's going to vote in the current season of company shareholding meetings. BlackRock's investment stewardship, BIS, is a team of financial professionals that liaises between corporate governance of the companies it invests in for the benefit of its clients. In 2021, BlackRock voted in favor of 47% of environment and social shareholder proposals That's 81 out of 172, the BIS said in its note. In the current season, BlackRock is likely to support proportionately fewer this proxy season than in 2021, as we do not consider them to be consistent with our clients' long-term financial interests, the BIS note says. (laughs) Laugh out loud. If you compare Fink's rhetoric in his letters to CEOs and shareholders, especially in 2020 and 2021, to what he and his firm are saying and doing today, the difference is overwhelming. Part of the issue, we guess, is that Fink himself is wilting under pressure. As our friend Justin Danhoff always said, and as we've often repeated on TV and radio, Fink wants to be famous and we should help make him so. Well... The guy's pretty famous now, and as it turns out, fame isn't all it's cracked up to be. Now that people know who he is and what he's been up to, Larry Fink is almost certainly wishing he could go back to being mostly anonymous, leaving fame to the pretty boy attention hounds like Jamie Dimon. A bigger part of the issue, though, as we said, is that Fink isn't stupid. He may be arrogant and nasty and self-absorbed, But he's not stupid, which is to say that he can tell which way the proverbial wind is blowing. Larry Fink is an important person because he is CEO of the largest asset management firm in the world. And he'd like to remain important, if maybe not as famous. He's not going to abandon his political crusades, obviously. But that doesn't mean that he won't scale them back a little bit in order to maintain his of viability within the system, to coin a phrase. This is all good news. We're winning. Markets are proving their wisdom and their resiliency. Faster, please. So that's the uh, political forum post that uh, Steve Sukup wrote. And uh, I just contacted him and asked if I could read it. There's no commercial anything in us in in this for us. I think his book is great. I think ESG markets are skewing markets around the world. And I think that people should have a look at some of our earlier reports. One is called Undue Influence, Markets Skewed. And it talks about exactly these kinds of things. Another report that we did is called A Confluence of Carbon Baggers. And it's on very similar themes, how these environment, social, and governance issues have skewed markets and investment markets. It's a very large part of what so damaged the Alberta oil sands investment. And uh, it's not not dealing with reality. Uh, So, you know, sadly, many accounting firms and accounting organizations, the people who are supposed to be saving us from bad financial decisions, have wholly adopted ESG accounting. Many securities exchanges in the world have wholly adopted this notion of ESG as a means of evaluating company performance when ESG is wildly subjective. And um, as we see, it's not leading to financial success. So uh, have a look at at Steve's book, The Dictatorship of Woke Capital, and uh, have a look at his blog. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling.